I've been out of the evangelical Christianity in which I was raised for nearly eight years now. It often feels like I'm not actively deconstructing that anymore, which feels strange to say given that I think I've been a recognizable figure in the deconstruction space for a few years. That said, some experiences still have the power to put me in the headspace where I compulsively analyze my journey out of the faith. In the most recent case, that experience was going back home for the holidays. I'm sure plenty of you can relate. Having previously dealt with how out of place I can feel in a Christian home, this time around I was able to explore how connected I still am to certain so-called Christian values. In that exploration, I realized something about my process of leaving faith and the church. My rigorous Christian education didn't fail. Rather, it instilled certain values in me so strongly that it backfired. Here's what I mean. Discernment. As a kid, I went to a Christian homeschool co-op instead of a public school. It was kind of like a really small private school, except most teachers didn't have degrees in education and the curriculum didn't meet accreditation standards. But, you know, since it was Texas, it legally counted as a school. Anyway, my fourth grade science teacher had us use American Sign Language in the classroom regularly. On the occasion that she'd wheel in the TV-VCR combo for us to watch an educational video, we would always have this dialogue. You know, class, sometimes people who are not saved say things that we as Christians know are not true. Who can give me an example? Millions of years? Yes, that's right. Now what's another one? They evolved? Good. So when we hear one of these things, we use discernment. That means that we remember what God has taught us and we don't accept things that are not true and honoring to him. So when we hear one of these things, what sign do we do? D for discernment. Very good. Okay, now we're going to watch a fun video about animals who live in Madagascar. My family loved this approach, and we incorporated it into everyday life. When we watched TV, we'd sometimes sign the letter D for discernment. When we went to museums, we'd sign D for discernment in almost every exhibit. Because actual science disagrees with young earth creationism. This practice got me in the habit of constantly scrutinizing the information I took in. I became nearly incapable of merely listening to and accepting claims I heard and was acutely aware of the fact that people regularly say things that aren't true, even if they aren't aware of it. My understanding of and relationship with God was on the line when learning about the world around me, so it was my moral obligation to figure out how to cut through misinformation and do so diligently. Years later, I was a senior at a Christian university and began a class on statistics and research methods. Pretty quickly, I realized that this would give me more tools to think critically than anything I'd taken before. By the end of the year-long course, that proved true. And naturally, I started questioning claims that I didn't have the tools to question previously. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had a moral obligation to think honestly about the metaphysical parts of the faith, about whether God was real, whether experiences with the divine could be explained naturalistically, whether ancient testimony is really all we need to prove miracle claims, etc. My new tools of discernment did not allow me to come to the conclusions which my Christian community upheld. At no point did I deviate from the practice which I was taught as a child. In fact, it was my diligence in that practice which ultimately led me to question the faith. A big thanks to the sponsor of this video, AdamandEve.com. A part of deconstruction for most of us is learning how to view sexuality in a healthier way, and a part of that is finding things that serve our wants and needs without shame. Adam and Eve was actually a part of that for me, so it's great to have their support on this one. They've got 24-7 customer service, 90-day no-hassle returns, and discreet shipping which protects your privacy all the way to your door. They've been in business for over 50 years, so they know how to make this easy for you. I highly recommend checking out adamandeve.com, and when you do, you can use my code SKEPTIC to not only get 50% off two items, but also get free shipping in the US and Canada. Thanks again, Adam and Eve. Now, back to the video. Putting others before yourself. 
Let me paint you a picture of my world in sixth grade. My biggest goal at the time was to complete more workbooks in the Awana program at my church than anyone else. This meant completing lessons and memorizing tons of scripture, specifically KJV. I even competed against another church in reciting Bible verses at one point. At that time, a verse that stuck out to me was Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Another was Mark 12, 31, where Jesus says loving your neighbor as yourself is a commandment second only to loving God with all your heart. And then there's my favorite story in the Bible, that of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus teaches that your neighbor is everyone, even those you've been taught to fear, hate, or avoid. I engage with these ideas nearly every day in my lessons. Meanwhile, at home, my parents converted a storage room in our house into an extra bedroom, which became a place where those in need in our community could live. Young people from our church or school who had broken homes moved in for months at a time, and I was taught to love them like family. On top of that, we regularly served at a Christian homeless shelter in an extremely impoverished area, and anyone who came in, I was told to treat as my neighbor. About nine years later, I began working on a master's degree in psychology, one which I admittedly did not finish. Even at my Christian school, which refused to focus on issues of gender nonconformity and sexual orientation, the program utilized credible sources of information which, if read outside of the lesson plan, included some information about these topics. I did read that information, and I found it extremely troubling. I learned that sexual orientation could not be changed by any known intervention, whether psychological or religious, even though there was a long history of trying. I learned that there are some genetic factors which correlate to homosexuality. Put in theologically relevant terms, being gay was not a choice. Further, I learned that LGBT people have a 120% higher risk of experiencing some form of homelessness, and that 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. LGBT teens are more than twice as likely to attempt suicide than the national average, and social acceptance is empirically proven to be the most impactful way to change this. Trying my hardest to see through my neighbor's eyes and understand their needs and interests like I'd been taught, I saw that the ethical course of action was clear. We must accept LGBT people for who they are and normalize their existence. This was 2015, and the Supreme Court was deliberating Obergefell v. Hodges. My church community was politically charged against the eventual ruling, as they insisted we must fight so-called sinful lifestyle choices at all levels. I realized I was at a crossroads. Discernment bringing me to disagree with my community on science and metaphysics was something I couldn't help. I couldn't control what convinced me. But which communities I aligned with and supported financially was a choice, and one with which my ethics needed to be concerned. Be in the world, not of it. As a teenager, I got very into aggressive inline skating. That's actually what got me into making videos for the first time. In the culture of the sport, it was common to film your progress as you learn new tricks and then make edits, so that's what I did. I made friends online that way, YouTubers before being a YouTuber was a thing, and I dreamed of meeting them all one day at Woodward Skate Camp. I am incredibly fortunate to say that my parents made that rather expensive dream come true. I understood very well, though, this was not just a chance to have fun skating for a week. It was an opportunity to be a light unto a dark world, to be a witness for Christ so that other campers might experience the love of Christ through my words and actions. I mean, the camp was in Southern California. I might be the only chance these campers would ever have to hear the gospel. A major part of this mission, I knew, was to stand out from others at camp by sticking to my Christian values of love, charity, grace, and purity, and not succumbing to peer pressure where doing so would be sinful. I was to be in the world, not of it. This is a phrase evangelicals take from an arguably questionable interpretation of the Gospel of John, and it means that Christians should not conform to non-Christian ideals, but stand out in order to set an example of godliness. 
Implied here is also the idea that the world will hate you for this, but your desire for acceptance should never override your principles. I studied apologetics for months before camp. That's actually where I learned a lot of the apologetics I talk about today. I read my Bible openly in my cabin every night. I willingly embarrassed myself by arguing with another camper about the historical accuracy of the Bible. I directly shared the gospel with a friend I made at camp, and I refused to swear or crudely talk about girls like most other boys did. People didn't hate me, but I was definitely not very popular with the other teens. Importantly, this was nothing special. In a Christian community like mine, this was standard behavior. Once I finished college, I saw a horrible choice before me. As much as I loved my brothers and sisters in Christ, I saw that the church was not a place where discernment and love for your neighbor were being practiced well. So was I to remain a part of it and be accepted, or set myself apart from wrongdoing and suffer the consequences of social suicide? Of course, I knew the answer, and in the end, I did what I was taught to do. Eventually, I told friends and family about my decision, which had already been obvious to them for some time. Most of my friends, raised in the same way as myself, showed me love and compassion. The adults who taught me these values, though, they asked me to violate their former teachings and conform even though I knew it was wrong. When I refused, they outright begged me to at least stay quiet so that I wouldn't incur social consequences from Christians. Some directly admitted that I'd be treated badly if I spoke up about things that even they themselves thought were wrong, and then implored me to save myself rather than try to be a light in the darkness. <laughs> I was astounded, really, and their response only motivated me to speak out more fervently. Looking back now, it's clear to me that I didn't leave the church in spite of my Christian upbringing, but rather because of it. From the perspective that the values I discussed here are Christian, it's fair to say that leaving the church was one of the most Christian decisions I've ever made. I don't think I'm alone either. I bet plenty of you watching could say the same thing. The question remains then, how did our parents' generation teach us these values but then apply them so inconsistently as to let misinformation, bigotry, and moral complacency permeate the church. I wish I knew. Maybe you're just less open to new information and different kinds of people as you age. Maybe our culture encourages self-interest so strongly that it overrides altruistic values over one's lifetime. Maybe evangelical Christianity attracts people who value conformity a bit too much. I'm sure the answer is multifaceted, but I can't help but think that the origins of present-day evangelical culture do have something to do with it. Most of our parents' generation, in the U.S. at least, were raised Christian, but not evangelical. Those who influenced them to join that tribe were part of a political movement meant to create a voting bloc who would consistently and dogmatically support Republican candidates like Ronald Reagan. To the elites behind this, Christian virtue wasn't the end goal. It was the bait with which they could lure good, trusting people into supporting elites who acted out of pure self-interest. This is still happening today, by the way. Why do you think oil billionaires fund the dubious religious zealotry of the Daily Wire? They've got to make sure that religious folks believe that voting for the interests of morally challenged rich people is actually God's will. With this in mind, I don't think it's surprising that the evangelicals of the generation who raised us struggle with moral consistency. They look up to those who don't model it themselves. I am thankful, though, that this didn't wholly eliminate their virtues. Many of them did, after all, pass enough of them along to us that when asked why we stand apart from the church on moral grounds, we can reply, I'm just doing what you taught me. Thank you for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support, especially as Taylor and I had to go on hiatus for medical reasons for a while. Well, we'll, we'll be all right, but it's still taking me some time to, you know, get 
back to normal. But as always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.